James Flahus. I'm a contributor for Wired Magazine. I'm here with Ian Goodfellow. He's a staff researcher at Google Brain. Uh, why don't you give us just a you know, top level introduction of who you are and what you do? Right, I'm a research scientist. I lead a team within Google Brain that studies adversarial machine learning. Most machine learning models, you give them a cost function that they should minimize. For example, they should make very few mistakes on the training set. In adversarial machine learning, there's now two players at two costs. So maybe you have one machine learning model that's trying to accurately recognize spam messages, and there's also a spammer who's trying to fool your spam detector into letting the spam messages get through. Now, why would you need an adversarial network versus just having a pool of data somewhere that you could use? Yeah, so sometimes there's a real world adversary, like someone who actually wants to fool our system into making a wrong prediction, somebody who can actually make money by causing us to make a mistake. For example, in um, search engines, you've heard of search engine optimization, where people earn money by figuring out how to get sites ranked higher. You could imagine that someone would want to fool the Google search ranking algorithm into ranking a site higher than they should. Um, that's the kind of thing that becomes adversarial machine learning, when there's actually someone who has an incentive to do something that isn't in your training set. Um, other times, we actually make up imaginary conflicts because they, they give the model an opportunity to practice and do something useful. Uh, for example, generative adversarial networks learn to produce realistic images via an imaginary competition between an image generator and an image discriminator, hmm. where the generator tries to make realistic images the discriminator gets points for detecting fake images and blocking them. And what are some applications of being able to do that? What can you do that you weren't able to do before? Yeah, so anything where you want to imagine a new input that wasn't there before, you can do with generative adversarial networks. Uh, we've seen that for things like creating training data for other machine learning models. There's a lot of work about uh, generating photos of people's eyes looking in particular directions so that mm. when they're holding up a cell phone, they can tell where on the screen the user is looking. It's very difficult to actually take photos of people and know where their eyes were aimed. But if you ask the generative adversarial network to uh, create a photo of a person looking at a specific place, it can generate that photo for you with exactly the right eye angle. And then you can train the eye direction recognition model from that kind of data. It's also been used for self-driving cars, doing things like creating imaginary data in adverse weather conditions, um, and for robotics. On the Google Brain team, we have a lot of work on robotics, and we use generative adversarial networks to create um, imaginary training environments full of all kinds of real-world clutter to <laughs> confuse the robot and make it, make it really exercise hard at, at picking up objects off of tables and realistic cluttered environments with lots of flowers and pictures lying around in the way. So there's scenarios where you don't actually have, there's a sparseness of training data, you can essentially make it yourself uh, to fill that gap. Yeah, it's yeah. really hard to write a simulator by hand that has all kinds of realistic detail. You'd need to have the person developing the simulator actually build all the 3D models of all the interesting objects. If you can just have a machine learning model create the objects in the environment for you. It takes a lot of the human effort out of the equation. Isn't there also an application in projecting future states, such as in video? And so could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, one of the classic problems with machine learning is that you give it an input, and you give it an output from the training set. And you tell it, every time you see this input, you have to give me this specific output. That works really well if there's only one right answer. Like if the input is a photo of a cat and the output is meant to be a category, it yeah. should really only ever tell you cat. For things like video, if you give it one frame of video and ask it what's going to happen in the next frame of video, there are a lot of things that might happen that could be a little bit different. Um, the example Jan LeCun likes to give is if you take a pen and you stand it up on a table, you know it's going to fall, but you don't know which way. <laughs> and uh, again, is useful because it's trying to produce a, a next frame that's realistic rather than producing exactly the next frame that was in the training data. So the, the GAN can actually understand that it's realistic for the pen to fall left, it's realistic for the pen to fall right, 
Um, it's not realistic to do what traditional machine learning algorithms do. Traditional machine learning algorithms know that the pen could fall left or right, and they kind of average those two results out. So you get a ghost blurry mm -hmm. pen that's uh, simultaneously falling in both directions. Let me ask you about the use of GANs in conversational or dialogue systems, uh, particularly in non-goal-oriented dialogues. In social or chit-chat conversations, you have that same problem of there not being necessarily a right response after a given dialogue utterance. Um, are you working on, or can you tell us about any applications of GANs in that area, where you're essentially predicting a plausible future state? Yeah, this area is actually very challenging for GANs because words and letters used by a chatbot are, are discrete. They're um, categorical variables. You're, you, you either output the word hello or the word goodbye, but you can't really find a word in between hello and goodbye. For images, it's easy to output either a dark pixel or a bright pixel or any level of gray in between. A lot of our training algorithms are based on gradually transitioning from black to white by visiting all the shades of gray in between. We don't know how to do that for language yet. So that's one of the key research problems we have to solve for GANs for chatbots. Uh, we submitted a research paper about GANs for text to the International Conference on Learning Representations this year. It's called MaskGAN, if you'd like to check it out. The What's basic, give us the yeah, highlight of that. Yeah, so the basic idea is we found that if you use GANs to generate text, uh, it, it's able to produce sentences that are more grammatical than other machine learning models. A lot of machine learning models do all these probability calculations where they say, how likely is it that a human would say exactly the sentence that you generated? And they try to make that probability higher. But those probability calculations don't always capture things like whether the sentence actually means anything or whether the grammar of the sentence is correct. With GANs, you train a discriminator to throw out fake sentences, and it can learn to catch all kinds of common mistakes that a machine learning model might generate and throw them out. So you can, you can train it to reject ungrammatical sentences. You can throw it to reject sentences that don't actually mean anything. Hmm. Um, you can imagine a, a lot of these data sets are based on uh, the Wall Street Journal, so you get a lot of sentences about stock markets and so on. Mm -hmm. If you had a sentence like, the stock market was acquired, that's grammatical. You know, you, you have subject, verb, Object. you know, a adjective at the end, but uh, it doesn't make any sense. You know, you can't acquire the whole stock market. Mm -hmm. um, again, discriminator could learn that acquired doesn't really go very well with stock market back at the sentence at, at the start of the sentence, mm -hmm. and and could throw that out. Um, and and you know, those those kinds of constraints added by the discriminator help to get more meaningful sentences. I'm going to switch to a, a different topic here slightly. Um, you've had some comments apparently lately about security and privacy in machine learning, and um, maybe share some of those here. Yeah, um, anytime we make a new technology, we tend to go through this pattern where first we build the technology, and then later we try to make it secure and private. With with telephones, originally, you know, you had the party line where. You know, you, you'd get on your little wall-connected phone and there'd be one wire going out down the street and everybody else on the street could hear your phone conversation if they picked up their earpiece. <laughs> then later we figured out how to isolate phone conversations. Um, we found that a lot of the time it could be hard to start out with something that works and then make it secure. Uh, we're all pretty familiar with how challenging it is to achieve really strong cybersecurity. Uh, and that's partly because we started by building the internet first and then trying to make it secure later. With machine learning, I think it's really important that we figure out how to make it secure now while we don't use it in too many important application areas yet. And Google Brain is being very proactive about that. We have uh, more than one research team studying issues in machine learning security and, and also privacy. And we've published a lot of work on both how to defend machine learning models and how to make them private. Yeah, when you think about uh, spoofing a neural network and uh, you and your colleagues have done some interesting research of sort of funny ways you can fundamentally trick a network, um, I mean, what does that lead to that's bad? Um, wh what is it exactly we're trying to prevent from happening in the real world versus a research setting? Yeah, it, well, I guess every application where you might use the machine learning model would have a different outcome. 
But suppose that you're trying to use machine learning to detect malware. That you know you download a program from the internet, and your computer runs a neural net to look at the program and decide whether it's safe to run. Um, you could imagine that a machine learning model could help you detect a lot of malware that you wouldn't be able to find with traditional techniques. At the same time, if the neural net itself is not secure, people could write malware that actually fools your neural net malware detector. They could make viruses that are designed to get through the detector just because they've fooled it. Um, but every, every application area has different things that the attacker might try to do when they fool your machine learning system. Gotcha. Let's see if there's anything else we're missing here. Um, yeah, maybe a, something big picture to close here. Um, which industries, uh, sectors of the world, are you most excited to see the implementation of some of these ideas that you're working on? Yeah, I'm actually really excited for GAN-like models to start being used more in healthcare. Hmm. Uh, there's already some work on using GANs to generate structures of molecules to be used for medicine. And I think that that line of work will become more popular and start to have more impact. Uh, that's a lot of why I got into AI in the first place, was I, I thought about a lot of important problems in science that I could solve that would help people. And I realized that I could actually have more effect by working on the tools that would help all these domains. Um, healthcare is one of those domains that I'm glad to see that the machine learning work I've done is starting to be useful as a tool for actually helping to cure disease. Uh, so what have you enjoyed about this event and what are you learning from being at this event? Yeah, as a scientist, I like to come here and get an idea of which problems I should be solving for other people to benefit from. Uh, in my day-to-day -day life working at Google, I'm mostly used to interacting with other people who know how to solve machine learning problems for themselves. Here I get to come see what do people out in the business world want machine learning researchers to solve for them. Hmm. Um, today, a lot of people were really interested in the CycleGAN model. It can do things like turn a picture of a horse into a picture of a zebra. And a lot of people are asking about extensions of that, like using it for face swapping and um, improving photos of groups of people where you could change individual faces. Uh, that's a level of granularity that researchers usually haven't looked at. And now I have an idea that that's something important we should think about. So you come here and people say, what can you do for me? Basically. <laughs> very good. All right, thank you very much. You're very welcome.